Moore. I'm a 2L um, and a conference co-director for this year's PILP. Um, I'm really honored to introduce our next keynote speaker for this year's conference. Um, Amy Cordalis is a member of the Uruk Tribe of Northern California, where she serves as general counsel. She is a fisherman, attorney, author, and mother. Her family is from the village of Requa on the mouth of the Klamath River in Northern California. Several generations of Amy, Amy's family have fought for the legal rights of the Uruk people, including her great uncle, whose Supreme Court case, Matt V. Arnett, confirmed the boundaries of the Uruk Reservation and the tribe's fishing rights. Amy continues her family legacy by working toward restoring the Klamath River while advocating for indigenous, human, cultural, and religious rights and tribal sovereignty. Her work has recently, recently been highlighted in High Country News and the New York Times. Amy graduated with a BA in political science from right here at the University of Oregon, and I was told by her husband that if you were here 17 years ago, you could see Amy flying through the air as a cheerleader at her Ducks games. <laughs> <laughs> and she also, she then attended law school at the University of Oregon and the University of California at Berkeley. Prior to joining her tribe, Amy worked in private practice and with the Native American Rights Fund, the nation's premier nonprofit law firm representing Indian tribes and tribal organizations. Today she will be speaking on reclaiming, reclaiming the Klamath. Currently, Indian tribes, farmers, and fishermen are vying for the Klamath River Basin's scarcest resource, water, creating one of the most complex and unsettled water disputes in the country. For decades, the basin has been saddled with near-constant litigation, high-stakes political battles, and anything else just short of outright war. But the story's origin goes back much further. In 1905, the federal government began drastically altering, developing, and managing, or reclaiming the land as the new Federal Bureau was charged to do the lush Upper Klamath River Basin lands to accommodate farming and ranching. These physical changes, complete with multiple downriver dams by the 1960s, initiated harm to the Klamath River's dynamic ecosystem and the tribal communities that persist until today. Now the Klamath fisheries are collapsing, the river is sick, and so are the tribal people dependent upon it. Amy, a Yurok tribal member whose family has lived in the village of Requa at the mouth of the Klamath River since time immemorial, will weave her family history with the development of the basin to tell the river's story. She will make the case that reclaiming the Klamath from the values, policies, and poor management that led to its demise and replacing them with principles of sustainability, equity, and ecology is the future of the Klamath River. So without further ado, I will introduce Amy. I'll let Amy take it away. to be with all of you today. Um, I had uh, asked the conference organizers if they would provide a mimosa bar and pastries and coffee, because it is a, um, what is today, Sunday? <laughs> um, so, you know, that'd be appropriate, but apparently that didn't make the cut. But I uh, appreciate all of you being here and um, coming today to uh, listen to the story of the Klamath. And I want to particularly thank the conference organizers for having me here uh, today. And I think they've done just a fantastic job of putting this conference together. And yes, uh, vision um, our up-and-coming lawyers have to have picked the theme of common ground. Um, throughout my talk today on the Klamath, you'll hear a lot about how we have tried to solve the problems of the Klamath Basin by finding common ground. And I think we're at a point in Western resource management where if we're going to get to sustainability, because of course that's the goal, we have to find that common ground. So excellent foresight on that. Um, before I get into the specifics, um, I, I kind of wanted to, to do a little bit of an exercise. Um, I think in the country right now, there's so much focus on division 
and our current presidential administration is inflammatory and um, probably for a lot of us what they stand for is not consistent with what we believe in. But I think coming to conferences like this, giving opportunities for people like me to speak, to hear the ideas that were shared at this conference, helps us recover from that kind of national politic and to also, to use the theme of my talk, sort of reclaim our own power and strength. So I, uh, in my own work, a lot of where my sort of passion and drive to get up and, and keep fighting even when things aren't good um, comes from a little bit of fire in the belly, right? Um, so I hope that all of you here got a little bit of fire in the belly and, and you feel that and you can take it home and you can use it to, to work harder towards whatever struggle you all might be working on. Um, so, taking that back to the Klamath, I'm going to try to get this to go full screen. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, a little bit of this. Um, the images you see in front of you are um, the mouth of the Klamath, a map of sort of what has become of the whole Klamath Basin. Um, of course, you know, the Yurok and the picture of the ocean is, is kind of right here on that corner there. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah. You can hear me when I talk like this? Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is the whole basin. So this is sort of what's happened. Um, and then this is a map of the Klamath Project. And what I hope to do today is make the case that what happens on the Klamath River over the next, hopefully, five years, or as long as 10 or 20 years, but however we find a solution to the problems here can really set a model for the country and how we decide we're going to manage our natural resources towards the goal of finding sustainable life ways. And I'm going to start with, um, of course, uh, the Yurok creation story, because for us, that's where it begins. Um, but then I'm going to take us through to when the United States government was creating its own relationship with water. And what happened then was water was viewed as a commodity to be pulled from a river and diverted, put in canals and dams and reservoirs in order to um, support mostly agri agriculture and economic development. And in doing that, and in taking that approach, what happened in the settlement of the American West was the bond between the land and the people and the water was severed. And when that happened, it was, it sort of enabled the country then to do things like this, right? Um, and so what's the legacy of that? And then in the middle of my talk, we'll talk about the legacy. At least on the Klamath River, that legacy has not been good. Um, and we'll get into the specifics of that. And so at the end of my talk, what I'm going to focus us on is sort of what we could do to get us out of this and to get us towards sustainability through reevaluating our water laws and instead of just looking at water and, and related resource management as a tool for economic development, as a commodity, instead incorporating principles of conservation, fairness and equity, and ecology. So that's kind of it. So, um, I think what we'll start with is this. Um, first, I want to make a little shout out to some of my peeps from back home. Hey guys. <laughs> nice to have you here. Um, my husband's here today, too. <laughs> Oh, some friends from back home over there, too. It's great. I'm so happy to see you all. Uh, okay, so a little bit about me. 
Um, as uh, Renee said, and thank you for that wonderful introduction, um, I am general counsel for my own tribe, the Iraq tribe, and in that capacity I manage our legal affairs. And the core of what the Yurok tribe does is try to preserve our fishing way of life, which means that we work very hard to try to restore the Klamath River. So a lot of my work is related to uh, restoration of the Klamath River. I'm, uh, my family is from the village of Brekwa, and Brekwa is just right there at the top of this picture on the north side of the mouth of the river. Um, and that, that's a, a great old, big Yurok village, um, but that's where we're from. And we fished the estuary of the Klamath River and then up um, you know, various locations up the, the lower part of the river since the beginning of time. Um, and so a lot of where my, my like, umph to do this work, it comes from being with the river, being um, a fisherwoman myself, and how much I love um, being able to do that. Um, let's see. So, how I came to this work actually kind of started um, when I was in here, going to school here, uh, and the fish kill happened. And that was a real turning point for me. And I decided it was time to get real serious about how to stop some of the challenges that were happening. And so I devoted my education towards um, environmental politics. And actually here at this university, I first learned that there was a, a topic of study on environmental politics. And to me, that was just like mind blowing. Um, that was the early 2000s, and, and I guess that was pretty you know, that was a thing people were doing, but um, it blew my mind that you could go to school and learn about environmental politics. And I just want to make a shout out to this university because I think they do a really good job of being inclusive and being tolerant of a lot of different ways of life and supporting um, different worldviews. And certainly that had helped me get to where I am now. So with that, I'm going to just jump into sort of the meat and potatoes of where we're going in this talk. So to explain kind of how all this came to be, I'm going to start with um, the Yurok creation story. So in the beginning, uh, the Yurok wanted to make, or excuse me, the creator wanted to make a place that was good. And so the creator started with the land and the water and then made the animals and the fish and made the ten immortal souls, different rocks throughout Yurok country. One of those is Oregos, who is kind of little in this picture, but is just right there on the north side of the river. Um, she's one of our sacred sites. And then lastly, Creator made the Yurok people, and said to the Yuroks that we would always have enough. We would never want for anything. So long as we lived in a balance with the natural world. Um, what that meant was that we never took more from the natural world than what we needed to survive. And in exchange, we would live good, right? We would have all that we needed. And um, so we, we agreed. And what I call that is our first cultural covenant, right? So I'm a lawyer, so I like to use legal terms, covenant, right? Like a covenant is an agreement that you make to do something in exchange for something else. So in the very beginning, what the Yurok people did was say, yes, creator, we will take care of this Klamath Basin. We will be the stewards. And in exchange for taking care of it, for being the stewards, we will benefit from it. And we will live well and we will have fish, um, you know, shelter, we'll have everything that we needed. And so that's what we did. Um, and I don't want to over-romanticize our Aboriginal times, but I do think it was a really good time. It was, um, um, it was simple in a lot of ways because you could easily go to the river and catch fish. There were fish in the river all year round, all kinds of fish. Um, they ate seals, they, 
there were eels there, and even out in the ocean, um, abalone and clams, there was always sufficient food. Um, and we built our homes uh, out of redwood planks, so fallen redwoods, we would split the, the logs and then make redwood plank homes. And they were warm and cozy and comfortable. Um, and so we had our basic needs met. And what that did was allow us to focus on other things because our immediate survival needs were taken care of. And so art, culture, uh, basket weaving, I'm sure a lot of folks have seen our very elaborate, beautiful baskets. Um, we had a very complex society. There was a hierarchy of people. Um, there were classes. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about that is um, there were dance people, right? And the dance people were sort of you know, they were held in high regard, um, and they they became dance people because they lived in a good way, and the Creator rewarded them with things that we made regalia from, right? And the more regalia you had, the more dancers that you could, um, you could more dancers you could like dress, and then you'd have enough to to put on the dance. And so that was the way that our society sort of reinforced this value of the cultural covenant. Um, and that's how we, we sort of managed things in that way. Yurok's Aboriginal territory included almost 500,000 acres of the north coast on, on the coast. Um, if folks are familiar with it, it's basically from just south of Crescent City all the coastal village, or all the coasts, um, unbroken down to about um, the Kilimo, Arcana area, and then up into the Klamath River, and then further east into what we call the high country. So it was a vast territory. Um, so one of the funny things that I wanted to share about my family's history is so we always lived in Rekwa um, since the beginning of time. And there's this fabulous story of um, Russian sailors coming to Rekwa, coming through the mouth of the river in the 1700s. Um, and I, I sort of see this as like, this was the first contact that my family had had with non-Indians, right? Russian sailors. So can you imagine um, the Russian sailors showing up and they're in a boat and they get through the, the mouth of the Klamath and they're in the estuary and the Yurok people are thinking, my goodness, like, what is this? And, and the way the story is told is that, you know, the, the sailors were covered in hair. All over they had hair. And it was like long hair. And there were bugs climbing through all the facial hair on their arms. You know, and Europe people, we're, we're short, right? Like, I, I'm, you know, we're short people. Um, some of us kind of look like Ewoks. So I sort of envision this, like, merge of, like, Star Wars and Pirates of the Caribbean <laughs> coming together. Um, all of the, you know, in the estuary of the family. But the story goes that the Yurok's wouldn't let them off the boat. You know, they just said, no, you are not getting off the boat. And so they stayed on the boat. Eventually, I don't know if the stench was starting to go from the river up the hill into the village or what, but um, the Yurok women offered to wash the clothes of the sailors. And so that was somehow facilitated. And there's these great stories of like, you know, my great, 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 great grandmothers and aunties scrubbing the sailors' clothes so hard that they all scrub them down to rags just to get the stench out. Um, but they sent them their clothes back and they were clean, and that was pretty much it. And the Russians left. <laughs> the interesting thing about that is on our regalia, on our really old regalia, we had Russian trade beads. You know, so we know that is true. So that was my family's first interaction with um, Russian non-natives. <laughs> um, so kind of turning into the 1800s and um, the beginning of the, the creation
Federation of the United States. Um, you know, folks are familiar with the concept of manifest destiny and how uh, you know, Europeans were moving westward under the guise of this is our religious right to, to move across the, the planet. Um, spreading the word of Christianity and the values of Christianity and, and, and sort of taking over the planet in that way. Um, by the mid-1800s, that sort of manifest destiny had made its way all the way west, right? Like you don't get any further west than the mouth of the Klamath River, um, at least on the continental United States. And so in Yurok country, you know, right around 1850s, things got bad. Of course, there was genocide, um, there were raids, there was taking of Europe lands and resources, and you know, all the things that you hear about happening to Indian people, that happened to us. Um, in 1851, the Yurok people negotiated a treaty with the United States government, and in that treaty, we secured not all, but a big portion of our Aboriginal territory. But those treaties were never ratified. Um, they were sent back to Congress, and through a back deal door, it was agreed that they would basically, that the treaties would be locked up in an archive and hidden. Um, and so that's how that happened. And then in 1855, uh, the Europe Reservation was instead created by executive order. And the reservation reserved a mile on either side of the Klamath River from the mouth here up 45 miles to the Yurok village of Wichpec. Um, notably not included in the reservation were the ocean villages and our high country, our spiritual lands. But in the creation of the Yurok reservation, the people, so the Yurok people, reserved our aboriginal practices, right? And, and that's an important thing because in Indian country, in areas where tribes were never relocated, like the Yurok, the federal government didn't give us anything, right? We reserved our own aboriginal practices, right? And because fishing was such a predominant um, way of life on the river, we reserved our fishing way of life. Um, and in the creation of the reservation, we also reserve the ability to govern the reservation um, and to assert uh, jurisdiction over the, the reservation. So the purpose of the Yurok Reservation was to create a permanent homeland for the tribe to reserve our fishing way of life. And that becomes an important point later. This, the, one of the second most important points about this particular um, historic fact is that in the creation of the reservation, the federal government made a promise to the Yurok people that we would be able to continue our way of life and that they would take actions in order to protect the river and to preserve our salmon fishery. So keep this in mind. So that all happened right around 1855. What else was happening in the country around 1855? Um, as it pertains to this talk, the, the sort of budding United States was beginning its relationship with water. Um, and what was happening was the federal government was encouraging settlement of the West. And there was a lot of uh, government reports coming out of D.C. offices claiming that the West was ideal for agriculture and that, um, you know, basically the rain follows the plow, right? We've heard about that. Um, several laws were passed around this time that supported Western expansion um, and agriculture in the West. Um, the Homestead Act, which offered surplus surplus lands um, to farmers, the 1887 General Allotment Act, which was huge for Indian country because what it did was open up Indian lands to non-Indian settlement. Um, and that act alone 
Indian country lost two thirds of its land base um, and a total actually of 108 million acres of 156 million acres that Indian country collectively had at the time. So these were sort of the, the, like, the laws and policies that were um, shaping the West. But then there was a problem. So our good friend John Wesley Powell, folks probably heard about him, and if you haven't, I encourage you guys to, to, to read more about him. Um, but he was moving through the West, and he was visiting Indian country, um, and he was also connecting with homesteaders who were trying to make life out of ag. And what he realized is that crops don't grow on rainfall alone west of the 100th meridian. And in that, he realized that the traditional agricultural practices um, that folks use in Europe weren't going to work here in the west because there wasn't enough rainfall. And so what happened was the federal government started looking to rivers in the American West to be the source of water for crops. And what that meant was that you had to divert the water from the natural stream and move it into reservoirs, into canals, diversions, and basically move it around to fit whatever kind of agricultural purpose you were trying to support. So this was, this whole scenario, this realization that the West was arid and that you were going to have to move water from rivers in order to support ag represents a critical turning point in the history of this country. Because in order to do that, you had to adopt a value that water is a commodity, that water has no ecological value staying in the river, and that it's okay to pull water and use it for an economic pur purpose, irregardless of the environmental consequences or the consequences to other user groups. And in taking that approach, what the United States government did was sever the bond between humans and water and resources in the West. And I think from that point, we've all been suffering in some shape or form. And I'm not trying to say that we haven't benefited from agriculture, because certainly we have. I think it's just been so extreme that um, we, have, we have some changes we need to make. Um, another piece of how that sort of relationship was justified was looking at the relationship between land and humans in Western religion, right? Which really says, you know, there's there's a heaven up here in this place is sort of how we've all fallen, right? We've all fallen out of the Garden of Eden and, and this is our, our consequence, our punishment. And so there's no there's no room for the natural world and the human world to live next to each other. And instead the natural world was made to basically support man and whatever he wanted to do with the environment under this particular worldview. And you can appreciate how contrary that is to the Yurok people, uh, bringing it back to Yurok country, and keeping in mind with our cultural covenant and how, um, how closely we live to that idea that we're supposed to live in balance with the natural world and how everything has a role in the natural world. And when you pull one species out, or if you take too much, you disrupt that balance. Um, one of the other things that we do on an annual basis to bring the world back in balance is our world renewal ceremonies. And uh, literally, our people you know, tap the ground when they dance. They dance like this, and they tap the ground to bring the whole world back into balance. Um, so this whole notion of how the federal government at the time of settlement sort of adopted this, this water is commodity, water to be diverted, is just completely contrary to the Yurok worldview. So 
Beyond severing the bond, what they then did was created rules and laws to reinforce this. Um, around the, the you know, late 1800s, you see the first water law doctrines um, popping up. Um, one of the most important was first, or was, excuse me, was prior appropriation. Um, and that was basically developed to support mining, um, especially down in California. Um, you know, the gold rush, the mining claims, there was a need for some order, and so the notion of water rights was whoever first appropriated the water, whoever diverted it, had the first right to that water in times of shortages. We call those senior water rights now. Um, another pillar of the prior appropriation doctrine is that whatever water you use has to be put to a beneficial use. And of course, at that time, beneficial uses were things like mining, industry, agriculture, domestic. But there certainly was no um, beneficial use recognized for just natural ecology, or for in-stream flows, or for river needs. Um, and so that basically shoved even the option of trying to leave water in the river and have that protected under these foundational water laws out. And I think this is an important point because, and, and I want to kind of hone in on this, in that this doctrine is based on fundamental principles of water law um, that value like use of water for an economic purpose, diversion of water away from its natural course to locations where people need it, and then the absolute rule of first in time, first in right, without regard to equities or consequences. The other thing that was happening around this time was the nation was looking to irrigation as basically the final tool to set its claws, its claim, into the American West. Um, and this is the time where this notion of reclaiming land comes to sort of dominate uh, Western expansion. And, and when I say reclaiming, what I mean is, is this idea that you had to reclaim wastelands or land formerly underwater that was unsuitable for agriculture. Um, which again, like, I, I, I think about, like, how could there ever be any wasteland, right? Like under a Europe world view, there is no wasteland. Um, and I think we would all agree there's no, there's no wasteland. Um, but basically at this time, wastelands were anything that didn't support agriculture. Um, so again, it was this idea that man is um, able to do whatever it wants with land without regard to the consequences. By 1890, California had the most irrigated lands in the nation, and it boasted the largest number of adults learn, or earning a living from agriculture. Um, across the West, between 1890 and, and 1900, uh, basically in only 10 years, irrigated lands grew from 3.5 million acres to 7 million acres. And, uh, through that acreage, smaller, uh, like local irrigation districts were starting to be formed, and they were asking the state governments for support to help move water out into their fields. So the, the states then turned to the federal government, which responded in a few ways. Um, one of them was by adopting the 1902 Reclamation Act. And, and I want to pause and quote the, the Secretary Interior of the time, who said, I have no fear that America will grow too big. A hundred years hence, these United States will be an empire, and such as the world never saw before, and such as will exist nowhere else upon the globe. Irrigation is the magic wand which is to bring about these great changes. So that, that was sort of, that was the national dialogue. Irrigation was the magic wand. So with the passage of the 1902 Act, the federal government um, created the federal agency that would be responsible for building the dams and 
the reservoirs and the canals that would pull water from the natural resources um, and move it into these, this irrigation uh, infrastructure in order to support agriculture. Um, and so not too far after that, in 1905, the Klamath Irrigation Project was authorized. And indeed, the Klamath Project was one of the first irrigation projects across the country. Can we get that? Thanks, Renee. So the Klamath Project presently covers territory in Klamath County, in Oregon, and Siskiyou and Modoc country, or counties in Northern California. The, the history of the project is interesting. So the area that is now in the project used to be the Aboriginal territories of the Klamath and Modoc Indians. Um, back in 1867, um, the Indians were still, for the most part, on the land, but settlers were moving forward. Um, in that same year, those settlers managed to get the first U.S. cavalry um, to leave uh, settlers in a war against the Modoc people. And I, I hope folks have heard about Captain Jack. Yeah. He's your grandpa. Well, what a, thank you for being here. That's wonderful. Um, well, I hope you, forgive me for talking about this. I hope it's okay. Everybody should know about Captain Jack. That's what, so this is exactly what I was just going to talk about. So Captain Jack fought the Army for four years, and he was never defeated. He was never defeated. And as I understand the story, instead his own people turned him in, and he was eventually executed in 1873. Five years later, after his passing, farmers introduced irrigation into the Klamath area. Five years later. So to support the farmers, uh, federal investigation into the Klamath project began in 1903, and then the official congressional authorization for the project was authorized in 1905, and construction began in 1906. The project initially was estimated to include just over 25,000 acres, excuse me, 225,000 acres of rangeland that would be transformed into farmland, we're reclaiming, right? 80,000 acres of land was also reclaimed by draining the lower Klamath Lake. Um, I've got a, a picture here that kind of lays out the project's orientation. Um, but you can tell, and, and I think even like by this map, it shows all the different components of the project. Um, the different sources of water and where the water is going to. It's basically you know, these red lands. That's the land within the project that is irrigated. Um, I am sort of struck by this map and in how industrial it looks, right? Which really just demonstrates the whole notion of this is how it's viewed now, right? So it's gone from its historical beauty um, into this working landscape that's somewhat been industrialized. Just to kind of hone those points in, from 1906 to about 1950, within the project, the Bureau of Reclamation builds over 17, or what is that, 717 miles of canals and diversions um, to support the Klamath projects. And the canals transport irrigation water from Klamath Lake um, and the Klamath River, Clear Lake and the Lost River, and then Thule Lake. And there are almost about 728 miles of drainage canals in the Klamath Project, um, which allow land that would otherwise be wetlands to be farmed. And since the inception of the project, it's served between 1,500 and 2,500 different farmers. Um, in the creation of this particular
particular pro uh, project. The federal government also made a promise to the irrigators that they would have water to support all of this land. Um, and as I understand, the project has grown to be somewhere closer to 350,000, 400,000 acres of water. In making that, that promise, the federal government um, created the problem that we see today. And th this is important because now you kind of see how you have tensions between what's happening here with the project and the promises of how water will be used with how the water over here and the promise that the federal government made to us. So I want to turn now to, to this map and talk about the creation of the dams. So from 1903 to 1962, four dams were built on the Klamath River without fish ladders that blocked over 30, or excuse me, 300 miles of salmon spawning habitat. Um, and that's where we start getting into this map that outlays what the, the basin is starting to look like. So um, the dams are basically between Karuk country and between, well actually they're marked there with the Klamath Hydroelectric Project in yellow there. Um, and each of the dams are, are noted on that. Um, and obviously that has, that, that has had extremely negative implications for salmon um, on the lower part of the river. So the Klamath Project and the Klamath Hydroelectric Project were completed without regard for any kind of impact that it may have had on your rights. Um, this is even though, or even through, the United States having a trust responsibility founded in the U.S. Constitution to protect our legal rights and resources. Um, but when all these projects were being done, important laws related to environmental protections were in place, and so there wasn't anything specifically on the books requiring the federal government to consider the impacts um, that these actions would have on your rock rights. Certainly I would argue that there's the trust responsibility that they should have kept in mind throughout the whole time, um, but that wasn't enough. So I, I think that is, that sums up the, the key part of the tensions that um, were created by the federal government through settlement of the West. And it sort of explains how we got to this place. Um, in the, the mid 18, or excuse me, the mid 1900s, uh, Yurok country was going through some pretty rough uh, experiences. Um, the State of California considered that our reservation was no longer Indian country because the reservation had been subject to the General Allotment Act, which I talked about earlier. Um, and they argued because it was open, it was no longer Indian country. Um, this was particularly difficult for my family as we were a fishing people and we um, had always fished on the river. The result of the state taking that position was that they basically tried to outlaw all Indian fishing. Um, and so, what do people do when they are fishermen? Uh, they keep fishing, even if it was illegal. And so my family had a, a long history of just keeping fishing and fishing, and they would fish at night so they could avoid the state game wardens. Um, during that time, we always referred to ourselves, or they referred to themselves, as salmon bootleggers because they kept selling salmon um, even though it was illegal. By the 1960s, my uh, great-grandmother, Geneva Matz, and some of their relations are here today, um, she was sick of bootlegging. 
Uh, she was a proud Yurok, um, and so she, she decided enough was enough. Um, she sent her kids out. She had adult uh, men who were you know, her children at the time. There were 12 of them all together. Um, but they went out fishing. And normally, how this all would go is they would go out fishing, and then they'd hear the state come up in their boat. They were the only one that had a water, a, a motorboat at the time. And so they would kind of know when the state was coming up, and they would pull their nets, and they'd hide under a tarp and wait for the state to go by. And then once they were off the river, they'd put everything in again, and that's how they avoided getting caught. Well, and one night in 1966, my great uncle uh, Raymond Maddox decided that he had had enough. And so they heard the, the state boat coming up the river, and he kept his net in the water. And if, sure enough, the state came. They um, basically gave him a ticket for fishing. They took his net and went on with their business. He appeared in state court later on, and the judge said, Pay me a dollar, I'll give you back your net, and you can go on with it. And he said, no, I know that I have, and they always call them Indian rights. I have Indian rights to fish on that river, and I'm going to assert them, and this isn't right. And so, that's what he did. Um, right around that time, um, Indian country's response to the, the civil rights movement was to create, in part, the California Indian Legal Services, which um, basically provided Indian communities with legal access, uh, or you know, access to um, attorneys that they had never had before. And so the family got one of these attorneys and moved the case all the way through to the Supreme Court. And in the Supreme Court, in Mass versus Arnett, um, it held that the Yurok Reservation was still Indian country, and because it was still Indian country, we had federally reserved fishing and water rights that allowed us to fish without regulation from the state. So Uncle Ray was right. We did have Indian rights, and, and they were confirmed by the um, Supreme Court. So you would have thought that that was the end of it. Well, no. So, <laughs> this is Indian country, so we battle always and always. Um, the Mass de decision was issued in 1973, and shortly after that, the state of California notified the federal government that if it didn't regulate Indian fishing on the river, that the state would. And so the Fed said, no, no, we'll, we'll do it. But what they did was then put a moratorium on all Indian fishing on the Klamath River. So we had thought we had won in the Supreme Court, the battle was over, we were going to you know, fish and life was going to be good. And then the federal government comes down and says, no, you can't fish at all. So the Yurok response was, well, we're going to keep fishing. And that started the fish wars. Um, and to enforce the moratorium, the federal government sent federal marshals in full riot gear, you know, uh, bulletproof vests, machine guns, huge jet sleds, and um, basically they patrolled the river. Well, there were a lot of interesting stories that came out of that time, but the one I want to share was that um, great-grandma and grandma decided that they were going to have a fish in. Right? And what that meant was they were going to go down and they were going to fish. Um, but they decided to fish in a little bit of a peculiar way where they took a cork line, so the top of a fishing net that has boobies on it so it floats, and normally you would have your actual net attached to that. But instead of that, they took that off and <laughs> attached their old bloomers <laughs> to the net. And then they went down and they put it in the river. And so, sure enough, the, the federal marshals come down, and they, and what they did every time, and my, my, you know, they knew this was going to happen. They started, you know, pulling the net up out of the water, and sure enough, they started to see all these old lady undies. <laughs> so, in late 1979, the fishing wars ended when the federal government lifted the moratorium and adopted
adopted uh, regulations for the Yurok fisheries, but I, I am confident that the old lady undies has something to do with opening the fishery. Um, sort of an interesting note is that at the end of this, that particular summer, um, my dad married my mom, um, and like at the church house door before the ceremony, he sold his machine gun that he used in the fish wars to his cousin and then walked in to get married. Um, and I was born before the next fishing season. So, I, I don't know, it's sort of an interesting thing how time moves in that way. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm going to kind of skip around here. Um, I think where, where we are now um, is that the, the Bureau, basically in about, the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, 1984 officially declared that the West had been reclaimed. They had um, built all of the projects that had been authorized in the 60s for moving water from rivers into reservoirs and dams. Um, and, and the official word was the arid West had been reclaimed and the major rivers had been harnessed and facilities were, being, were in place um, to meet the most pressing current water demands of those in the immediate future. So what's the legacy of, of this work, right? The legacy of what's happened in New York country, the legacy of all this construction and these values of um, uh, you know, water as commodity. Certainly on the Klamath River, it hasn't been good. Almost, actually 100 years to the date, in 2002, the um, largest fish kill in American history occurred on the Klamath River, entirely within the Yurok Reservation. It's estimated anywhere from 34,000 to 100,000 adult salmon died from fish disease. And that fish disease was all caused by um, man-made conditions on the river that were in large part affected by or created by the, the Bureau of Reclamation's management of the river. There's nothing in Bureau's his, historical, traditional, legal, logical knowledge that talks about that massive of a fish kill. So that, that's not normal, right? And, it, it, and then as we learn more about what caused the fish kill, really what it was, was in 2001, um, water, as a lot of people probably know, was cut off for irrigation. And um, the President of the United States, George Bush, Vice, Cha or Vice President Cheney, um, Gail Norton, who was the Secretary at the time, got involved. And um, by golly, the irrigators were going to have their water for the second, or for the next irrigation season in 2002. And so they got their water. Uh, but during that time, the tribes and others said, if you divert this much water, you will have a fish kill. You will have massive disease outbreak. So they were warned. Um, but it happened anyways, and they allowed it to happen anyways. So I'd like to say that here we are in 2017, or 2019, geez, and um, it's like a war, right? <laughs> um, I'd like to say that we've made some progress on the Klamath River, but I can't say we've made that much. Uh, just in 2014 and 2015, we had massive fish kills of the baby fish. An estimated 80 to 90 percent of the out-migrating baby coho and chinook salmon died in those years. Again, because of a fish disease called C. shasta. And what, what, how that happens is when there's not sufficient flows in the river to like flush out the disease, it, it festers and it grows and then it attacks the fish. And that's also a repercussion of the Bureau's management of the Klamath River because what happens now is, um, you know, black, well, so there's two ESA species, three is ESA listed species, and water flows are managed according to those species, but really the Bureau manages those for ag deliveries. 
So a lot of times in the winter and dry years, the hydrograph on the river is just like this, right? It's just steady. And that's a time under the natural hydrograph, of course, where you would have high, low flows sort of moving like this, which would flush out all that disease. But because the river is so regulated and so natural, or so, you know, intervened with, um, you have these kind of fish disease that are just rampant. So the baby fish are dying. Um, I think the hope, the, the sort of, um, well, the hope is dam removal, right? Um, we're on track towards dam removal. We're moving through the regulatory processes now. Um, I think things are going in a really good way. One of the interesting things that the California State Water Board did in its draft EIR for the 401 <laughs> Clean Water Act discharge permit was designate the whole Klamath River in the Yurok country as a tribal cultural resource, right? So the river state, yeah. Oops. Which is much more consistent with that Yurok worldview of a cultural covenant. Um, and so we're making progress there. I have run out of time, and I appreciate you all staying here. Um, so I'm going to make one final point, which is that in order for us to move away from this legacy that settlement and the, view, the Bureau of Reclamation has created here in the West and in the Klamath Basin, how we get away from that is by reclaiming our own resources and our own way and moving towards reforming our laws and our policies to value conservation, fairness and equity, and ecology. That's how we get to a sustainable way of life. I believe that there is room for sustainable agriculture at the top of the basin. I believe and will fight to the nines to make sure that the fishery is healthy. I will also fight for the Klamath Lake um, and the fisheries there. Um, I believe in the ability of the Klamath River and the basin as a whole to regenerate herself beyond anything that we can comprehend. But we have to do our part. We have to put that connection back together. And I believe we can do that with those three values of using water for conservation, fairness and equality, and ecology. So with that, I'll wrap it up. And I want to thank you all for being such a great audience and um, allowing me to tell my story. And um, I don't think we have time for questions, but I'm happy to um, talk with folks. So walk aloud. Thank you.